I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Jan Bluestein, a professor of health policy and medicine at the Wagner Graduate School and the School of Medicine at New York University. Dr. Bluestein has co-authored a perspective article on pay for performance for hospitals. Dr. Bluestein, you note in your perspective article that the effect of financial incentives on individuals is well understood. Is there evidence in the healthcare arena that pay for performance that focuses on individuals as opposed to hospitals improves quality and outcomes? Yes, of course, um, much of the evidence comes from beyond healthcare, but within the healthcare arena, there is evidence that incentives um, that are targeted to individual providers can work well under some circumstances. Um, the ones that I'm most familiar with are, for example, uh, incentives for immunizing children. And these have worked in several cases in several settings and have been useful in keeping kids on track in terms of their immunization rates. So pediatricians can do that, and uh, there are many other examples. So returning to hospitals, you look in your article at Medicare's Premier Hospital Quality Incentive Demonstration Project, which had somewhat promising early results, but then disappointing longer-term results. In fact, we recently published an article by Ja and colleagues that showed that the program did not reduce 30-day mortality. How do you interpret that sort of finding? Along with the other evidence, uh, collectively, this raises questions about whether the program's apparent early success was real success or just selection. That is, uh, were better hospitals just agreeing to participate in the demonstration? And more troubling, later work cast doubt on whether the hospitals and the demonstration were responding to the incentives at all, so whether incentives mattered. Um, uh, and, of course, the two new papers suggest that the demonstration didn't have an impact on mortality. So in some, I guess I'd say that we'd be hard-pressed to say that the demonstration is compelling evidence for nationwide hospital paper performance. Do you think the demonstration project focused on the wrong measures? Um, no, I don't. Um, you know, I think that it's a, a bigger problem. Um, the theory, I think it really has to do with the theory behind the payment approach, which is that organizations will respond to f financial incentives. And I don't doubt that that's true in some cases, but it's quite notable that we haven't been able to pinpoint an instance here. Hospitals are really complex organizations, and they operate in a complex environment. There's certainly a lot going on besides Medicare hospital pay for performance. There's really a mind-boggling array of competition for managerial attention, and anybody who's talked to anybody or who's involved in hospital management knows that that's the case. So I guess my response to the question you know, can pay for performance work is a little like my response to the question, can communism work? My answer would be maybe. Um, but given the real-world complexities of a market-based healthcare system and, and combine that with the limitations and vagaries of human behavior, it seems to me that this is a little bit of a moot question. In fact, despite the negative results, pay for performance seems to be gaining momentum in the United States. So why do you think that is? Yeah, it's remarkable, isn't it? I think there are probably several reasons, and I'll offer a few. There are probably a number more. I think, bottom line, this is a notion that appeals to some pretty deeply held beliefs. Americans believe, you know, that hard work should be rewarded and sloth should be punished. We believe that efficient firms should and will prosper and that inefficient ones should, should wither away. I mean, this is Econ 101. And we believe that money is a strong motivator because we know it is in our own lives. So the policy is very appealing on that level, I think. Another, I guess another thing is that it's relatively easy to do. It's straightforward to superimpose paper performance on whatever else is going on. So unlike other payment reforms, like bundled uh, payments, for example, it's pretty easy to implement a pay for performance program. Um, and it makes us feel like we're doing something. So it's got that benefit. Third, and I think it, you know, it's obviously taken a while to accumulate evidence. You know, the premier demonstration started in 2004. And these papers about the impact on mortality are appearing in 2012, so that's a long time. In the interim, it was, you know, arguably reasonable to believe that um, these, this demonstration will have an impact on mortality, although I would argue that um, skepticism was warranted a, a bit earlier. And I'm, uh, for, I guess I'd make a fourth point, which is obviously that, that the policymaking process and the political process have their own timeline and their own process. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act is, is packed with programs that were added in the press of time. And some of these are probably good ideas, and others probably not so much. I'm sure others could add more to that list. 
In your article, you focus on ways to improve paper performance as the value-based purchasing program is rolled out by Medicare this later this year. And what you suggest is studying the effects of the program on hospitals and responding to them. Should this have been done earlier before the rollout? Well, it, c- it certainly could have been, and that w- might have been very helpful. Um, and for a number of reasons, some of which we've just discussed, that didn't happen. In this piece, what we're arguing is that this means that the folks at CMS will need to work hard to monitor their imp- the impacts. And I know some of these people, they're good people, and they'll do their best, but they have limited resources. And I think, um, you know, given the lack of demonstration evidence and given that we've now decided to go forward with this, I think the research community has an important role to play. We know that the program is not likely to have substantial impacts on quality, but I think we need to carefully monitor the financial impacts. And this program, um, after all, is going to be taking money from low performers and giving it to high performers. And in as much as low-performing hospitals are disproportionately under-resourced hospitals, those hospitals that operate at a financial disadvantage, we need to watch this carefully. Uh, and CMS will be doing this, and so will the research community. Uh, as we know, uh, you know, as we say on this perspective piece, there's really there's a lot of money on the table, and it's important to watch this. Are there, in fact, other payment approaches, either for hospitals or physician groups, or perhaps new accountable care organizations, that have shown some promise in improving care? Sure. I mean, I, I would say, <laughs> stepping back, I, I confess that I'm a firm believer in the single a single payer system, and I'm at a loss to see how we can get costs under control in a market system. Uh, the, the record is not good. Um, I also don't see how we can assure equality and quality in a market system. But that said, I understand um, that a single payer system isn't coming soon, and accountable care organizations seem uh, promising to me. I think early evidence suggests that they can work well in some places. And that's, that's really exciting, and it's potentially very good news for patients. Um, how ACOs might work in New York City, where I'm sitting today, is an open question, but that's another story. Physician groups recently re- released a list of 45 common diagnostic tests and treatments that, in their view, are often unnecessary. Do you s- foresee a P4P approach that would reward physicians for not performing certain tests or not prescribing certain treatments? Well, I can certainly foresee that happening. Um, I wouldn't be in favor of it. There are actually, in this case, other approaches that work. There have been some very successful efforts to reduce overutilization that have been based simply on provider feedback. Um, It's helpful for clinicians to see where they are relative to their peers. They're very, you know, we tend to be very interested in that information. So in view of that, and for other reasons that have to do with professional autonomy, it seems to me that making this part of a pay-for-performance effort is a little bit of overkill. Thank you, Dr. Bluestein. Thank you.